Story 15, Operation Europe, part two. In the first part of Operation Europe, I described how the organized crime source that was willing to testify about his crimes and crimes of his organized crime group in exchange for witness protection program or similar arrangement uh, got in touch with the PSD and testified about scary events. However, soon after it became clear that story is way bigger than anyone expected, the enthusiasm of criminal justice system to proceed with the case vanished. Police failed to address the issue that this organized crime group have stolen three kilos of drugs from one of the Croatian generals. In another situation, which was more peculiar and that kind of indicated that this case is not going well, was the situation where police failed to seize 40 kilos of explosive and unknown radioactive material based on sources, clear description on where and how the assets were hidden, who are people in charge, and how exactly to dig out these illegal goods. The problem in this situation was that when police were conducting the raid over the house of the criminal, they basically targeted the house, even though the source clearly suggested that those goods are in different objects, not in the house of the boss of this criminal chain. And what police didn't know is that in order to protect himself and to test his trust into criminal justice system and us, the source was recording the police raid, which showed a really friendly relationship between the police and criminal that they were investigating during the actual search that was conducted in the house. When we started asking questions to the criminal justice system involved in Operation Europe, it was suggested to us that the boss that was targeted of this operation, one of the targets, was an informant, high-level informant of Croatian intelligence agency, and that sometimes, as they said it, lesser evil is tolerated in order to prevent the rape of damage. I personally was shocked by this response because it was hard to me to believe that 40 kilos of explosives and radioactive material was lesser evil. In addition, what worried me the most at that time were shocking stories on how women were forced to enter the prostitution chain and trade it as a slaves to Western Europe brothels. How horrifying were these stories? You can listen yourself in the audio interview that BBC at the time conducted with the witness from the Operation Europe, where he reveals some of devastating truth after he assumed that the criminal justice system sold him to the other side. To learn how these criminal networks operate, the BBC arranged to speak with an experienced trafficker who has kidnapped and transported men, women and children across European borders. Being at a secret address for fear that his former criminal associates in the trafficking gangs will kill him. We've agreed not to name him and not to broadcast his voice, so his words are read here by an actor. You're speaking to us on a phone line. We don't know exactly where you are, and you're only going to talk to us for a few minutes. What are you so frightened of? The gang who abducted me came to my house and threatened to kill me and my family. 
My mother called the police, but when they came to the house, they told her they didn't want to get involved. When the network is operating, finding men, women and children to send abroad, how did you find these people? Most of the time we used professional recruiters, but we would also kidnap women and children ourselves. The children were taken to be sold in Italy and the better looking women were kept as prisoners and made to work as prostitutes. The men were transported wherever they wanted to go. How old was the youngest child you abducted? Around 18 months old. They were sold in Italy. I've heard that sick children are sold and made into beggars. The healthy ones are kept and trained to work for the mafia, to deal drugs, to murder, whatever they are capable of. I have also heard that some children were sold for organs. This happened with men and women also, depending on the demand. And did you use force in order to capture them? Yes, often. If they didn't want to be separated from their families, we'd hid them until they did what we wanted. What happens to these people once they've been abducted? How are they transported to another country? The men we usually drove to Slovenia, from where they travel further into Europe, to look for work on building sites and places like that. Or sometimes we transport them from Bosnia to Croatia by boat across the river Sava, which we controlled, then by car or lorry north through Croatia to the Hungarian border, where we'd smuggle them through a forest. What kind of force is used to keep them working and under the control of the network while they're in a foreign country? Generally threats are made that another family member will be murdered if orders are not obeyed. Are you protected by the authorities now that you're preparing to give evidence against some of your former colleagues in this network? No, there is only one man from the authorities I can rely on. This is because the authorities are involved with these networks. There is a lot of corruption. I've been on the run for the past seven months. No one knows where I am. I haven't spoken to anyone for seven months. Uh, do you mean that officials have been paid the bribes by the network in order to cooperate with it? Yes. One final question. When you look back on the time that you spent with this network, what do you think about what you were doing? I feel terrible. Do you feel ashamed? Well, I'd rather say I suffer from a guilty conscience. Why did you do it? Money. The organization sheltering this trafficker is Croatia's Partnership for Social Development, an anti-corruption campaign led by Munir Podomlak. He started revealing data that actually covered five countries and indicated members of diplomatic corps, members of high level of certain ministries, police department, that are one way or another involved in crimes. In one of testimonials he revealed the coercion methods that his organized crime group would use against women in order to force them into prostitution. And I'll try to quote him here. He stated we would use cocktail called Nirvana for such purposes. The cocktail, as he described, is made of combination of synthetic drugs, heroin, and LSD in different quantities that I'm not going to describe here, but testimonial described it in very precise detail with very precise recipe. After the cocktail is made, they would inject the substance into the woman that was subject of their coercion, usually in an area of groin or somewhere where the injection will not be visible afterwards. After the injection, the victim will basically, as he described it, be aware and awake, but unable to resist anything that was done to her. In this 
stage, they would expose the victim to continuous rape by the members of the organized criminal group. That would be recorded on a videotape. As he continued further, this cocktail would be given to a woman every two days in a course of 10 days period. And entire scene would repeat. After those 10 days, the victim would become addicted to heavy drugs, mostly heroin. They will show the video to the victim, threaten that they will expose the video, which is what will show that she's not resisting the rape, or she would have to work for that. The leverage that they used in this situation was her addiction, as she needed her. So there was not much choice for the victim in this situation. And I just want to remind you that to this intelligence community responded that this is a lesser evil. The source as well explained that addiction to heroin of the victim of trafficking played well for them because they at the same time, of course, trafficked large amounts of drug and heroin across the Europe. So the price of heroin for them would be significantly lower than for the ordinary heroin user. In this Operation Europe, witnesses all provided over 200 phone numbers that are used by criminals, traffickers, police, lawyers, politicians, and members of diplomatic services that were involved in this case in nine countries. It has all revealed the level of sophistication of some of the actors of this network. For example, one of the key persons in Slovenia would, uh, for drug transportation and other criminal activities, use the car with diplomatic plates. One Italian law enforcement officer that was the key protector of the chain in Italy, especially in border crossing and informing the criminal group on the activities of the law enforcement in Italy, usually used the Belgian SIM card for his cell phone so that it could not be tracked by the Italian law enforcement or any other law enforcement due to very complicated procedures and lack of the agreement between European Union member states on issuing a warrant to monitor or wiretap a phone number of the foreign country. And finally, the source, as you probably already heard that from his personal testimony of the BBC, he addressed the abuse of children in this chain, where mostly Roma children would be abducted in the Western Balkans, trafficked to camps in Italy in order to be sold as sex slaves for the rich clients, or trained as a professional thieves and assassins for the Italian mafia, which was a very important part of the scheme. Namely, those kids that would be 12, 13, 14, when they committed serious crimes such as assassination, uh, they could not be tried as adults in Italy. The second thing, as they were kept in camps and they knew only their guards, they would never know 
who is the actual contractor of, for example, assassination. So the structure as established was very, very valuable to Italian mafia, but as well other mafias present in Western Europe. These stories made me personally sick as they were hundreds of hours of testimonials that in detail described different cases with the real names and real human beings in each of those cases. The acts of violence were portrayed in so much detail that they looked as a horror movie. But they said that there is a greater evil out there that is worth trading off a human being and a child. As some of you already know, we are in this last effort to change the way we think and act against corruption. And here is what I want you to do. Subscribe to our YouTube channel. Follow our Facebook, Twitter and Instagram accounts. And every day Take 10 minutes of your life, watch the video, share it, and ask your friends to share it further. If we succeed in this, they cannot stop it. Finally, participate. For each video, I want you to become a juror and judicate and give your opinion on what you believe is the truth and what you believe is right and wrong done by different actors. If you want to save others in this fight, donate to the account on the screen under the title Save the Fight. That's all what I want from you. Everything else will be done by me and only me. Thank you very much.